Good morning, and welcome to worship this morning. It's great to see all of you here on this very brisk, cold Sunday morning as we join together in our Father's house offering worship and praise for all that he's done for us. And today as we look at this, as we're wrapping up, this is the second Sunday of Christmas. We're wrapping up our Christmas season, moving next week, I believe it is, into the baptism of Jesus and then Epiphany. And we look at all of that and we go pretty quick from here on out until we hit into the, the Ash Wednesday and the Lenten season. And today we'll be looking at Jesus, the 12-year-old boy, the only account we have of him in his childhood and talk a little bit about that as he's being about his father's business in his father's house. So with that we follow our order of divine service as printed out for us is also up on the overhead. And we begin with our opening hymn, O Word of God Incarnate. We stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Dear friends in Christ, our own sin and our inability to free ourselves are the re reasons a Savior was born. We now confess our sins to God, confident that he has first chosen and loved us, giving us forgiveness for the sake of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, I confess to you all my sins in thought, word, and deed, some of my sin. I am by nature sinful. My works do not show a life of faith and repentance, nor do they glorify you. We have not lived according to the purpose of God's will, but have neglected the richness of his grace with indifference and disobedience. Have mercy on us. <laughs> Upon this, your confession, and through the Holy Spirit working in us, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
Let us pray. Almighty God, you have poured into our hearts the true light of your incarnate word. Grant that this light may shine forth in our lives through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading for today comes from 1 Kings chapter 3. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson comes from Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it and to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. We stand for our gospel reading. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the, first ch the second chapter. <clears throat> the child Jesus grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was twelve years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. 
And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we join in singing within the Father's house.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Our text for our message this morning, it comes from our gospel reading of Luke 2. It was read a few moments ago from the lectern. Dear friends in Christ, I don't know if you've noticed how quickly Christmas is celebrated and then it's forgotten. The stores, they've already gotten rid of most of the Christmas stuff, and if there's anything less left over, it's 60, 70, 80 percent off. And they're replacing all of that Christmas stuff now with New Year's stuff, and now it's going off the shelf. But now they're replacing it with Valentine's material. Radio stations have all stopped playing any kind of Christmas music. There doesn't seem to be many Christmas movies on TV anymore. And I don't know if in your house, if you've started taking down Christmas trees and decorations yet, and some people have, and boxing them all up and putting them away into storage until next year. This isn't very different from what happened on that first Christmas when we look at that first Christmas pretty closely. The shepherds, they went back to their sheep. They had a job to do. They went and spread the news concerning this child, did all of that stuff, but then they went back to work. They had sheep to take care of. The magi, they came and they dropped their gifts, returned to their home in the east, and all too soon, Mary and Joseph are left with this baby, this child to take care of, to feed and clothe and make sure things happened. And, and ahead of them was this very awesome task that they had to raise and nurture the Son of God. God gives us four books about the life of Jesus in the Bible. And the gospel lesson for today is the only one that gives us a story or a brief glimpse, if you will, of Jesus and his childhood. Luke notes that when Jesus was 12 years old, Mary and Joseph and Jesus, and probably Jesus' younger brothers and sisters, they all went up to Jerusalem as usual. Mary and Joseph went up to Jerusalem as was their habit. It says, God made a good choice through them. It was their habit to go to Jerusalem. And they were committed and involved in their faith. They were committed and involved in the religious activities of their time. And it certainly had an impact on, on Jesus. It was a requirement of all Israelite men who lived within a 15-mile radius of Jerusalem to travel to the city and then to celebrate the Passover each year. And this is what Mary and Joseph went and did. But here's the unique thing about this. Joseph lived in Nazareth, and that was outside this 15-mile radius. Joseph didn't have to go up there. He didn't have to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. <clears throat> it was only the men who lived in this area and who were required by God's law to do this. And actually, the women didn't even have to go either. But I want you to look at the devotion. The devotion and the obedience of this family towards God's law. Every year, it says, his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. They didn't just want to give a little of, to the Lord, the most minimal part. They wanted to give all of their life to him and their life's devotion year after year after year to the Lord. These are very, very important elements of the Christian walk of faith, worshiping regularly and being involved in the religious activities that the Lord has through his church. They were there and doing this. And for us, parents and adults living out their faith in the everyday lives, they live that out so their own children can see this and they can observe what it means to be in a relationship with God then and what habits are important in that relationship with our Lord. And now we move to that more well-known part of the story. We all know it very well. After the feast is over, the family returns home. It's time to go back home. And now remember, back then there weren't buses, there weren't trains, there weren't airplanes, there weren't any of that stuff. Walking back then was the main mode of transportation. They walked. Often when these things happened and they would come to Jerusalem for these big celebrations, especially the Passover, they came in groups, they went home in groups. And there was a good reason for that. It was safer in a group and the time went by much faster when you had friends and family around you to talk and to, you know, explore things while you're walking to go back home. Maybe you've wondered how on earth, 
how on earth could Jesus have been forgotten in Jerusalem? How could his parents have left him there and left him and not know he wasn't with the group? Well, here's the deal. Mary probably would have been traveling with all of the other women and, and, and who had decided to come along. And the reality is the women probably left maybe about an hour or so before the men did. And if that's the case, she must have thought, well, Jesus is going to be with Joseph and he's going to be with all the men and the boys and whatever. Since at 12 years of age, he's just becoming a man. So her thought process was he's probably with the guys out there. Joseph would have been traveling a little bit later after the women, making sure everything's together and gone. He's with the guys, and he must have thought that Jesus was with his mom and the women. He's still a child. And then children oftentimes in these big groups, they would separate off into their own groups to play and to do other things and to, you know, just be children, just like children do today. On that first night of their trip back home, Mary and Joseph are setting up camp and they look for Jesus. They look for him among the group of people that they're with. They assume that he's been traveling with the group, especially with the children when they headed back home, but they can't find him anywhere. He wasn't with the other children. He wasn't with any of the relatives at all. And he wasn't with his friends. He is missing. Mary and Joseph had lost track of Jesus. If you were a parent and you had lost your child, you probably would have been upset and you probably would have started to panic. And maybe some of you have experienced that in your lives, that you've lost your child. And rightly so, you panic because of what happens to that child. Mary and Joseph were very upset and they, they go back to Jerusalem and they look for Jesus. How many days? Three days. Three days they look for their son, trying to find him. And they look and look and look. And I'm sure all kinds of questions were really starting to go through their head at this time, when you think about it. Think of the thoughts and the questions racing through their minds. Is he lost forever? Has he been abducted? Was he killed? Is he just hurt? What's the deal here with Jesus? The fact was, as we know from the story, that Jesus wasn't any of those. He was in the place where you'd expect to find the Son of God to be. He was obedient to his heavenly Father by staying and learning a whole lot more about his mission. There they find him in the temple, eagerly learning the word of God, learning that word from his heavenly Father. Young Jesus, he was a humble student there, humble student of the word, enthusiastically engaged in the word and in the Bible study there. It says in our text, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. I can imagine, and I think you can too, think about this. Imagine Mary and Joseph coming around the corner of the temple, and there's Jesus. You finally find him. There's a 12-year-old boy in the temple, your son whom you've lost for four days now, basically. You find him there, and he's interacting with the teachers in the temple. He's discussing with them. He's debating with them. These great teachers of the day, he's in there with them. It just wasn't every day that you'd find a 12-year-old boy so interested in the scriptures and so respectful of his elders. I don't think I was that interested in God's word when I was 12. How about you? But Jesus is. We're told in verse 47 that everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. He's in the temple with the big teachers of the day, learning and growing. Picture that very frantic search of Mary and Joseph retracing their steps very carefully from camp the first night backwards into Jerusalem. Retracing their steps all through Jerusalem trying to figure out where they were. Visiting all the places that they had been. All the places they had slept. All the places they had visited. All the places they had eaten at. Talk to anyone who's, who's looked for a uh, family who might possibly know where their son might be. 
talk to anybody on the street if they remember this boy. And then imagine their emotion when they find him. Imagine the emotion. First there was relief. He's not dead. He's not in a hospital room someplace. He's not got broken leg. He's not abducted. They find him. There's relief. But soon it's replaced by irritation. After all that Jesus had made them go through. Relief, then irritation. And Mary confronts Jesus and scolds him for causing his parents great anxiety. Even though she doesn't fly off the handle at Jesus and, and overreact to the whole situation, you can sense a little bite in Mary's words as we hear from the text. Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And notice what Jesus does. This 12-year-old boy... He doesn't respond by saying, I'm sorry. He replies with a rather cryptic statement. Didn't you know I needed to be in my father's house? And this phrase is really better translated into the English this way. Didn't you know that I needed to be about my father's business? You know, when you first read that answer... It might sound a little bit snotty coming from a 12-year-old boy. But of course, since Jesus is perfectly obedient, those words couldn't have had any sarcastic tone or meaning to them at all. And the best way to take these words is Jesus being honestly surprised at his parents that his parents wouldn't have understood and known that he would be in God's house since he was God's son. Notice Jesus doesn't say, I'm obeying God, so forget you. But he also is very obedient to God's representatives, his parents. And then verse 51 tells us, then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. This 12-year-old recognized that God had placed human authorities over him and he was glad to obey them. Mary and Joseph, they didn't understand what was going on here. They didn't understand what Jesus was saying to them. What does this mean that he had to be about his father's business? You see, at that young age of 12, Jesus knew that he was the, not only the son of Mary, but he was also the son of God. He knew that his purpose in life was not just to be a good son and obey his parents and grow up and learn all the stuff that human children do. There were other important elements in his walk of faith. He knew that he was on this earth for a far greater purpose. He had the divine mission to fulfill, to be the savior of all humankind. And part of that mission then was spending time in God's word. Specifically, there was the need to study. There was the need to debate. There was the need to discover. Listening to the teachers of that day, asking them questions, filling himself with the words and the promises of God that are found in the scriptures. That was his father's business. It was so important that he came up missing from that entire large group that they were a part of as they were returning to Nazareth. Jesus didn't stay in Jerusalem, our text says. He went back with his parents, back to his hometown of Nazareth. Jesus also continued to study and to debate and to discuss. This process allowed him to increase in wisdom and prepare him then for his ministry as he continued to learn and grow. Jesus would someday be about his father's business and the ultimate business by dying on the cross. That was his ultimate mission in life, to be the savior of all people. That was why he was there on this earth. That was his number one priority as he's there in Jerusalem and with his parents back in Nazareth, to save sinners. And that includes you and me and all people for all time. Jesus comes searching and looking for each and every one of us because we were lost and we were separated from God. 
Jesus finds us, and Jesus is about the Father's business, forgiving sins, rescuing us from sin, death, and the devil, giving us wisdom for how to live this life and live out our life and make it really count. The business of God is to question, is to debate, is to disgust, and expand one's understanding of God, humankind, and the world in which we live in. That's what our business is about. The activity should be part of every Christian's walk of faith and constantly in his life be doing that. So that we, too, will grow up in wisdom, making right decisions, using good judgment in how we live out our lives. Our Savior Jesus first makes us alive, growing in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God, giving us an entire new life by grace through faith. You can put it kind of like this. God's business, God's word, if you will, in the new year, in 2022, let God's word, his business, be your priority as we start this new year and continue in 2022. Put God's business, God's word first in your life. Someone once said that a Bible that is falling apart, is just in shambles, belongs to someone who isn't falling apart or in shambles. God's business, God's word. Here you find Christ. Here you find that baby born on Christmas, which we just celebrated, for the sole purpose of taking away the sins of all people for all time. Here you find him dying on the cross in order to save your soul, dying on the cross to take on your punishment for your sin. Here we find him rising from the dead, promising to give eternal life to all who believe in him. Here Christ blesses you, fills you with joy and peace, and the kind of love that only God, our Heavenly Father, can give. That's God's business. Let that be your top priority in the year 2022, and you will be blessed. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all of our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in true faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We stand for prayer. Blessed are you, O God, our Father, for in your great wisdom, mercy, and love, you have chosen us to be your own children. We praise, glorify, and give thanks to you for the forgiveness of sins and adoption into your family through Christ our Lord. Grant peace to your whole church. Lord, to the praise of your glory. Almighty Father, we offer our worship and praise here in your house. When we depart from this place, we pray we may continue to be centered in your mercy and grace through your word and sacraments. Bless the homes of your people. Grant patience, strength, and wisdom to parents and every member of every household. Lord, to the praise of your glory, <clears throat> let your Holy Spirit seek out and reveal your salvation that all may hear and believe your saving gospel. Cast away all doubt. Strengthen the faith of your people everywhere. Work peace among the conflicted nations of the world. Protect all who are persecuted and suffer hardship and death for the sake of your word. Guide those who make and administer laws to rule wisely, act justly, and protect the weak. Lord, to the praise of your glory. Bring your healing and comfort to all who are sick, injured, or in need. Assure them of your mercy and give them comfort, restoration of health, and the peace to accept trials and tribulations. Lord, to the praise of your glory. As the true body and blood of your Son strengthens the faith of those who approach your altar, grant the wisdom that comes from above, that all who commune be one in confession and faith. Help us to prepare our hearts and minds as we receive the forgiveness of sins in the sacrament. Lord, to the praise of your glory. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. The Lord be with you. <clears throat> Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him the Messiah, the very Lamb of God, and calling sinners to repentance that they might escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. Prepare us joyfully to remember our Redeemer and receive him who comes to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in Jesus' name and as he has taught us, our Father who art in heaven. <coughs> Kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which was shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. Please be seated.
We stand for our post-communion prayer. Let us pray. We give thanks to Almighty God that you have refreshed us through this gift. And we implore you that of your mercy would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. When you heard the word of truth and believed in Christ, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. As you have heard his word and give thanks for the power of his spirit, go as his chosen people in praise of his name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our closing hymn. Good morning to all of you. It's great to have you here this morning as you go about your walk with the Lord this week, your priority for the year 2022, the new year. Get yourself immersed in the word of the Lord. Get in there, learn, grow in wisdom, knowledge, and stature just as Jesus himself did. And train then children up in that, grandchildren, nieces, and nephews, so they too know and understand and know the will of the Lord God for their lives. Have a great rest of the week with the Lord. I'll see you in the back.